Christmas, the most wonderful time of the year, with the most festive movies of the year. But not all Christmas movies are created equally. On one side, you have the theatrical studio Christmas movie. We're talking your elves, we're talking your home alones, you're the Santa Clauses. These films aren't blockbusters per se, their budgets are often medium to small. But they're significant when compared to the micro-budget Christmas movies that our moms have grown to love. Like Time for Him to Come Home for Christmas. Or Time for Me to Come Home for Christmas. Or Time for You to Come Home for Christmas. Or Time for Us to Come Home for Christmas. Or A Cookie Cutter Christmas. Okay, that last one was a departure, I know, but I lumped it in because I actually spoke to the guy who made the music for it. Hey, I'm Russ Howard, and I am a film composer. Almost every day on Hallmark during Christmas season, there's a good chance if you turn on the TV, then you'll, you'll run into some of my music. I called him up to talk about how all the Christmas movies we know and love, and the ones we might not know yet, sound Christmassy. Like many things, those decisions start with money. While studio film budgets are in this range, Hallmark movies are generally made for $2 million and under. Although... I think most of them are shot for maybe like four to 500,000 and, and less. When it comes to music, only a small percentage of the overall budget is allocated for it. Traditionally, it's about 3 to 5 percent, 3 percent being more the average. And then if it's a very song-heavy movie, that would push it up to that 5 percent. Let's take Elf as an example. It costs roughly $33 million to make. 5 percent of that is just over $1.6 million, more than the whole budget of some Hallmark films. So they were able to afford a scene like this, where Zoe Deschanel and Will Ferrell sing a popular song. I really can't stay. Which, uh, I can't actually play more than that here for fear of getting flagged for copyright infringement. But anyways, songs like that one cost a pretty penny. And just how much is a pretty penny? Well, I emailed a bunch of music supervisors to try and find out, and one got back to me, Lexi Brewer. She mostly works on the cable TV side of things, and via email, she told me that the traditional Christmas songs we know and love tend to cost somewhere in the ballpark of $25,000 per side. Per side is important to note here, because when you want to license a song for a movie, there's actually two sides to every clearance. Like, let's say you want to play Christmas, Baby Please Come Home in your movie. I don't know if I know that one exactly. You definitely do a song that's like, Christmas, the snow's coming down. Oh yes, of course. <clears throat> um, editor's notes to uh, Michael Buble, Darling Love, and anyone else who sings this song, please don't sue us for doing that. The first fee you have to pay is for the composition of the song, using those notes in that order. $25,000 or thereabouts goes to the music publisher. The second fee depends on what those notes in that order sound like. You could have the original recording or the cover by Michael Buble. Either way, you need to square up for at least another 25 k But depending on the song, the artist might want more and then the overall cost increases. Lexi explained with this example of Mariah Carey. If she wanted twice as much as the traditional rate on her side, then the other side would likely match, doubling the total fee. Of course, these are all loose numbers. These kinds of deals generally aren't made public, and Lexi works on the TV side of things. She didn't know the numbers specifically, but she said that streaming and theatrical fees are likely more expensive. So that might not be exactly what Mariah or other artists might charge, which is why you would hear other artists covering Beatles songs a lot of times. because they could pay for the right to use the song, but not for the right to use the Beatles. Not licensing music ahead of time can get you into some sticky situations. Like Russ was telling me about this one time where a rough cut for a film that he was working on for Hallmark had a scene where characters sang Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. You know, I get to be the bucket of cold ice water on their Christmas dreams and say, hey guys, like these songs very well could cost more than the movie budget, you know, to license. They ended up cutting that scene from the film. But if they would have known what songs do and don't have copyright, there's a way that they could have made a similar scene for free. A lot of the Christmas songs we love are not what we call public domain. Public domain, or in other words, free from copyright. It's the reason that you hear this song in so many movies. You to be alive. 
lot easier if we were facing the other way. You were facing the other way. What have you done? When it comes to public domain in the US, every piece of creative work made before 1928 is totally open for anyone to use. Anything created after that, for the most part, is A-OK -okay 70 years after the creator dies. So this song you're hearing right now, it was written by Tchaikovsky for the Nutcracker in 1892, Public Domain. What's great about the public domain Christmas songs is it's this like shared cultural experience that we all have. These cost nothing and are Christmas as heck. They're used in movies big. I'm sorry, I'm late. I was, what the, what is that? And small. White. And because they're open to the public, composers like Russ can recompose bits and pieces with no worries about having to pay a huge fee, or even worse, getting sued. The trick is recomposing them to fit the mood of a particular scene. If I was going to take like joy to the world, and then I wanted to make it maybe a little more moody, I would maybe... My job is like, how do I take that and make it work to a scene? This is Deck the Halls fit for a baking montage. But for me, the most interesting rearrangements of these classic songs are the more warped ones. Russell was able to make sinister versions of songs we know and love for the Christmas slasher It's a Wonderful Knife. Joy to the world in my kind of like an evil version. Did you detune the bells too? Uh, yes, yeah, they're they're a little bit detuned, so they sound a little bit off. There are many ways to rearrange the classic songs we all know and love, but sometimes the cheat codes of the Christmas sound can boil down to a simple instrument. Tinkling bells. And then of course. But it seems like no matter how you get there, the most effective way to spread Christmas cheer is public domain Christmas songs for all to hear. As we wrap up this festive episode, we here at Vox have a request. Since 2020, Vox has turned to readers to help keep our journalism free. We believe that information like this doesn't belong behind a paywall. And if you believe that too, then help support our mission by going to box.com slash give dash now to make a contribution. The goal is 95,000 gifts by the end of the year. And that's just a few days away. So click the link in the description to learn more.